welcome back to the Darbar Hall at the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. Our session today is supported by session series partner British Council. Journeys Home, Marina Wheeler in conversation with Navdeet Sarna. Marina Wheeler opens the portals of memory as the daughter of a woman traumatized by the partition of 1947 that divided British India into Pakistan and India. The Lost Homestead, My Mother, Partition and the Punjab tracks a parallel story of the dreams of nation building in India and also a displaced woman's struggle to find economic and social space in her new habitat. Vila follows her mother's buried past, her marriage and move to England where she refuses to look over her shoulder at a lost world. Marina is a Queen's Counsel in England. Author and diplomat Navdeet Sarna's book include the book of Nanak, Savage Harvest, and The Exile, a novel based on the life of Maharaja Dilip Singh. He is the former High Commissioner of India to the United Kingdom. In conversation with Navdeet Sarna, she explores the meaning of Punjab, Sikh identity as it survives through cultural transitions. Marina Wheeler is an Anglo-Indian, London-based barrister specializing in constitutional and human rights law. She was made Queen's Counsel in 2016 and also teaches meditation and conflict resolution. She writes regularly for the UK Human Rights Blog as well as national newspapers, usually on legal subjects. Navdeet Sarna is the author of the novels *The Exile* and *We Weren't Lovers*, like that, and the short story collection *Winter Evenings*. His non-fiction works include the Book of Nanak, Second Thoughts, and Indians at Herod's Gate, as well as two translations, Zafar Nama and Savage Harvest. He served as an Indian diplomat for nearly four decades in places as diverse as Moscow and Warsaw, Thimphu and Tehran. He held several critical appointments, including as India's Foreign Office spokesman, ambassador to Israel, High Commissioner to the UK, and Secretary to the Government of India. He retired from diplomatic service in 2018 as India's ambassador to the United States. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Journeys Home, Marina Wheeler, in conversation with Navdeet Sarna. Over to you, Mr. Sarna. Thank you. A very warm welcome, uh, Marina, and it's a delight to be able to talk to you and discuss. Uh, your book and around your book, uh, the Lost uh, Homestead, which is uh, which covers partition, which covers your mother's life, your grandfather's life, uh, your own uh, uh, childhood, and and growing up, uh, it's a delight uh, in many ways. Particularly looking at the subject of the book, you know, it's it. The book spoke to me when when I was uh, reading it last week because uh, there are so many of us. There are so many of us who are uh, what what should I say? Not children of uh, midnight, but we are grandchildren of partition in in a way that you know we have heard we are children of, of refugees, uh, so called from what is today Pakistan, uh, and we have heard about. Uh, the partition it's there in every punjabi refugee's drawing room you know hanging around like banco's ghost it's sort of always there whether it's about the you know the wonders that were left behind the lands that were left behind and the fruits that that can never be matched the weather the climate that can never be matched but we don't all go and write a book about it uh, so what was it that that took you in that direction and that you persisted good afternoon after thank you uh, just to say how nice it would be to be sitting uh, side by side there in jaipur but it's still delightful uh, to be able to discuss my book with you albeit remotely uh, and i i think you're you're absolutely right um the partition is there within many many punjabi families but i think mine was certainly one where it was um it was not even as as present as banquo's ghost i think i think my mother was from one of those families who went to great pains i think to to bury this part of uh, of their history and i didn't growing up know anything other than the absolute bare bones and of course i didn't grow up in india 
Um, I grew up in, in the US um, predominantly and then the UK. And so it was really an unspoken um, part of my mother's background. And all I knew really, I knew she used to use this phrase twice displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew that the first displacement was the partition. Uh, and the second was when she left India for, for good. But, but that was really a very sketchy knowledge I had. And I think the trigger event was in fact the 70th anniversary of Indian independence and the partition. Uh, and here in the UK, it was an event that, that made quite an impact. I think interest in, um, you know, the empire and the past has grown in part because of the very large diaspora that there is now here. Um, but, but watching some of that coverage with my mother uh, and watching a particular film that I know you'll know of, Gurinder Chudder's film, Viceroy's House, it really came to me how my mother had herself lived through this extraordinary period. She witnessed these events. She said, oh my goodness, about various historical events that she hadn't thought about in um, decades. So I saw that her story was one um, that would be of great interest. But I, I think it was there was also a, a sort of more personal element to it, which is that I could tell, I mean, my mother was 85 when we began, I began sitting down to talk to her. I could tell that she needed me around. Um, and when someone suggested this as a book, it just seemed, you know, a wonderful opportunity. And also, I think I had learned that, you know, these stories that all of our parents have and don't speak about um, can only too readily, we're all mortal slip out of reach. Absolutely. I think you've touched on several in very interesting points in, in, your, in your response. So before I lose that, that, that thought, I just wanted to carry on. You know, you said there was this, you know, Viceroy's house and, and a rekindling in the interest, uh, interest in, in the empire, so to speak. Um, but are you sure it's because of the diaspora? Is it uh, relate, you know, uh, what's, what's happening to the UK? You know, uh, five years ago, it, things towards Brexit were already building up. And, and I find that, you know, there's more and more sort of harking back uh, to the great glory of the empire, whether it's, uh, you know, the earlier there was one jewel in the crown, but now there's the crown and there's, you know, every, every, everything, half the things on Netflix talk of the empire. Uh, can't you relate well, this to <laughs> what's happening or what happened? I mean, to be honest, Stanton, we could have a whole seminar discussion on that alone. And, you know, it might be great to, to do that at some point, because I think that's such a fascinating subject. Mm. And I don't think I agree um, that there's a, a harking back in the sense of a sort of nostalgia and in mm. the sense of we want to be imperial again. Mm. I really don't agree with that. I think it's a much more nuanced examination of, of the past, as indeed it, it should be. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, Britain, of course, after Brexit is thinking about its position in the world, its global mm. role. Um, but I don't think there's any, um, <laughs> any sort of fantasy about, mm. um, you know, ruling the globe. I think it, there is an acknowledgement that, mm. you know, Britain has been active in the world um, but it's not a, a great power. And the best, I mean, perhaps I'm talking, I'm talking really just personally, but I think the best it can do is to try and be an example, you know, of some of the shared democratic values that, that we have, liberal democratic values, you know, which do include um, mm -hmm. things that are relevant to, to India and to, to Britain about living in a multicultural uh, society. So, but I think we could talk about that endlessly, and it's a subject I'm fascinated by. Yes. Um, and I think in writing this book, I mean, yes, um, part of me, because it's such a complicated subject, I think we in the UK have, have shied away from talking about empire. And of course, you know, we don't learn it at school. It's, it's too complicated to be on the curriculum. And so a bit of me was, yes, wanting to you know, some of these events just, you know, for the first time, look a bit more closely and find out, well, what actually did happen? Uh, and, and as I say in the book, I do discover that, you know, everyone's idea of what happened and what, how to interpret it 
is yes, very, yes. very different. I think, yes, I think, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, perhaps <laughs> comes to some of those uh, as we go along. But uh, you, you do say that, you know, you're, you, you grew up in US and UK and, and, and you know, and, and your mother's own silence to which you refer to uh, repeatedly wouldn't have made this uh, a daily conversation. And uh, mm. so, in a sense, you came to your curiosity late. Yes. And um, you must have had to speed read uh, uh, on, <laughs> on India. But, you know, when you, one reads your book, it's kind of a part memoir, it's part travelogue, uh, it's part, uh, if you like, popular or potted history. Uh, mm. So is that what you actually set out to write or it developed as you wrote that? I mean, I, I don't think I had a very clear idea um, of, of how it would evolve. I mean, I knew that I wanted to both look at, um, try and unpiece the past a bit. I wanted to find out more about my grandfather, mm. uh, who in the book is, is Papa G, um, who I never really knew. I mean, I met literally once uh, and couldn't speak to him really. Mm. Um, I mean, he did speak, speak English and, and I was young. Uh, but I knew very little about him. So, I mean, that part of it was I wanted an exploration of my own family, uh, mm. the history, and as I've said, you know, the history and part of, of why partition. Uh, but going back still further, I wanted to have a sense of, you know, what was it like for a privileged Indian family living in pre-partition days? Because, I mean, as, as you referred to, we do hear a bit about Brits in, um, you know, the empire as it was, but, but I didn't really have any sense of, of what was that like and how present were the British and all of those things. So that um, was part of what I was after. But I also did want to look and see, well, what does this all mean for modern India? Mm. Um, and, you know, I have, as I say in the book, I have a, you know, a wonderful, huge, family of um, cousins and nieces and nephews in India and, and abroad. And I wanted to see, you know, and I'm aware of what's going on in, in India and, and to what extent I wanted to know are the, the, you know, the Nehruvian ideals that my mother spoke about, how much are they still present in, in India today? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, in a sense, I think I did what I, I hoped to do. And I think what I was very clear I couldn't do was write a, a, a sort of definitive history. And you're right, it's a sort of sketchy attempt to look at what happened. But through a bit of a, you know, the eyes of someone who's, you know, grown up quite British, but who has, I think I have affinity with India, but also someone who's able to travel to, to Pakistan too. And I, I think that was, a, you know, another element of, um, of what I hoped for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've, you've actually hit the point which I did want to talk about uh, at some stage, and course we may as well do it now. Uh, I think you, you mentioned the fact that you were able to travel to Pakistan. Um, so I think the process of research that you probably undertook or could undertake uh, is something which would be difficult, say, for a person like me. Uh, I mean, I, I also did manage to go because I had a certain um, a facility at one time as a diplomat and, and I happened to go uh, back and look for, for my father's uh, place in, in Rawalpindi and, and found the place but not the house as, as, as you know I won't give away all your book but you know as happens in so many of our, of our journeys but uh, the, the fact remains that did it help to have a British passport? Uh, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. Yes. I mean, I, I, I went through the ordinary channels um, to get my visa to go to Pakistan, um, you know, schlepping off to, to way, way east um, of, of even here in East London, where I live, to Stratford and, you know, getting sponsors and so on. But, but I'm sure it did. I mean, certainly none of my Indian relatives, and I mentioned in the book, you know, my cousin used to go to Kinnaird College in Lahore to visit where my aunts used to, you know, there was always an exchange and that was a really important people to people contact that, you know, neither can, no visas seem to be available now. So yes, and, and weddings too, um, as I mentioned in the book, you know, a family in Lahore, who my, some of my family members had helped to, to reach Lahore 
they haven't been able to travel. So I'm sure it did help. Yes, I mean, that's a huge step because, I, you know, my mother came from there and, you know, she she's written an autobiographical story in, in Punjabi, which actually translates as to how far is Lahore. And wow. it's about a story of somebody standing in Amritsar and saying, this is only 30 miles, yeah. you know, and how difficult it is to go back uh, yeah. to see where I studied and, and where I lived. But these, these are the sort of human tragedies of, uh, you know, of, of separation. But again, the other aspect that you mentioned is, is a kind of, and I don't want to make it sound more than it is, a, you know, a certain kind of privilege. And here I'm not talking about your position as a researcher, but, but, well, you must have been aware when you told your mother's story that she actually comes from a very privileged family, a landed family, mm -hmm. a grandfather who has a position, uh, and they actually move away before the violence starts. I mean, your mother actually moves away, if I remember right, in the spring of 47, yes. and goes away to Kasoli, and she doesn't really feel the transition. And then you carry on life in a very privileged uh, you know, golf links, Sujan Singh Park, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of India, which is a very, mm -hmm. you know, microcosm of privilege. Mm -hmm. But, but you must have been aware that the partition was was a very terrible event uh, for most people. So, it, a lot of the stories that you read and people have written are about bloodshed, about loss, mm -hmm. about uh, killings, uh, about rapes about suicides of uh, girls uh, and and so on and so forth did this somehow did you feel that you weren't going deep enough into this whole thing or were you sort of skipping it because that wasn't your story well i mean i think i was very aware at the outset mm. of course um you know that that i was telling the story of a privileged family and i think i'm I think I'm quite careful to underline my awareness of that in the book and, and not to try and, you know, make it something that it isn't. And I don't think that I, I hope that I don't hide the fact that others were experiencing something, you know, far more uh, traumatic. And, and I think I try in the book, um, I suppose, to sort of marry the, the, the personal family story, which is a story about a privileged uh, family, but try and marry that with some of the wider history of, of you know, of the time. Uh, but I think that I was, I thought that there was still a role in exploring, you know, the experience of such a privileged family. And of course, you know, with my own family's experience, it wasn't about, you know, the loss of family members through, um, you know, the, the partition violence itself, although my mother's brother was lost through, through TB. Um, and that was a sort of different kind of, um, you know, grief and loss that in, in many ways, as I say in the book, eclipsed the loss of sort of material. Um, mm. but, but I think that, you know, my grandfather as a figure, uh, I felt this, you know, his, the transition, I suppose two things. One, that he was a person who had status you know, in essence, because of um, he held positions of authority that were, of course, conferred by the Raj. Mm. Uh, you know, he was president of the municipal committee. Admittedly, you know, the, the Brits weren't particularly sort of present uh, day to day, but, you know, he, it was a structure that was set up by uh, the British. But the loss of that status, the loss of the home, the loss of a way of life, which of course did include, you know, a, a life that was very, I think, I mean, this is a slightly jargonistic word, but cross-communal. Uh, I mean, you know, their lives were, the gentry there in Sargoda were, you know, Hindus and Muslim families, as you know, you know, yeah. brush on. Yeah. So, so that whole loss of that existence to something in India that was very, very different. Um, mm. I mean, I was interested just to explore that sense of a uh, loss, not use it as a vehicle in the, you know, to explain about so much the horrors of... Um, right, opposition. right. Well, there was a loss of an entire way of life, and you're absolutely right in saying that, you know, that that's a worthy enough subject uh, to, to be ex explored. Um, but at this stage, I mean, do you think it's a good idea if you could read us something, perhaps something about... You know, the way you were 
traveling or the way you were researching this, so that I leave the choice to you. But a short passage would give our listeners a feel of, you know, what the book is about. Yes, sure. I've, I've actually selected a couple of pages, not too long. Um, but I thought maybe a flavor of the time I spent in, in Lahore um, might be of interest. So this is quite far on in the book. Um, it's, it's towards the end uh, part, I suppose, what you, Navtaj, have called sort of the travelogue part. Yeah. So I'll just read a, a couple of, of pages, which looks a bit about, you know, me tootling around Lahore, but also a bit about my mother as well, my mother Deep. Mm -hmm. So this is just starting now. But Shahi is one of the world's largest mosques. The fearsome Emperor Rangzeb completed it in the 17th century to commemorate defeating the Hindu king Shivji in battle. It's like Delhi's Jama Masjid, but bigger. Four tapering minarets of red sandstone decorated with marble inlay and three marble domes surround an enormous courtyard. After the Jallianwalabagh massacre in nearby Amritsar, a cross-communal protest of 30,000 Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims assembled in this space. In Sikh times, the army used the mosque to garrison weapons and horses. The British did too, until mounting Muslim resentment made them rethink. Then they restored it, and the Viceroy John Lawrence handed it back for use as a mosque. A tomb of red sandstone and marble dedicated to the poet Iqbal sits on a raised platform. As a child, Deep learnt Iqbal's verse by heart and recited it to her father at bedtime. Before I set off on this trip, she drew slowly and carefully on a small piece of card, a snippet of it in Urdu. Take it with you, she said. Back then, in a rush, I gave it a cursory glance. The script seemed a bit shaky, uh, but I was impressed by her recall of Urdu. I didn't ask what it meant. Now in the car, I fish the card out of my bag and hand it to Maz, our security officer. Despite a small error of syntax, he knows it instantly. On Quora, the international Q&A website, he finds me a translation and a short explanation. Kudi is Iqbal's idea of self and its relationship to destiny. Develop the self so that before every decree, God will ascertain from you what is your wish. Deep has remembered this verse all of her life. Later, she explains, I understood it to mean that you shape your own fate. It isn't just mapped out for you. Iqbal's own life was marked by what Sunil Kilnani calls a crippling irony. In England, he fell deeply in love with an intellectually daring aristocratic Indian Muslim who shunned the veil. He conceived of a life full of freedom and agency, but when it came to it, he capitulated to the will of his parents and married according to their wishes, not his own. Once aware that she had a will of her own, Deep asserted it, and all in all, I'm very pleased that she did. The old fort is a succession of palaces, halls and gardens commissioned by the emperors Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. We were fortunate to have Fakir Ajazuddin, Ajaz, one of Pakistan's most eminent art historians as our guide. In the spectacular mirrored throne room, Shish Mahal, the 10 year old Sikh, uh, Ma the 10 year old Sikh Maharaja, Dalip Singh, son of Ranjit Singh, caved into the British. He had no choice really. Flanked by officials from the East India Company, he signed the formal act of submission, ceding the Punjab and with it the Kohenor diamond. Ajaz ushered us across a yard to an unpromising building. Up a few steps, we came to a heavy door, bolted and locked. Ajaz had the key. He shifted the bolt and we entered a large, dimly, hit hall, dimly lit hall. Here, in seclusion, lay a collection of paintings and artifacts, tracing the fortunes of the Sikh kingdom under the illustrious Ranjit Singh and his disappointing descendants. As well as being a fount of knowledge, Ajaz tells a great story. Standing before a panorama of Ranjit Singh's court, painted by the Hungarian August, August Schuft, he pointed out a handful of figures. These were his forefathers, three Muslim brothers who had served as ministers in the Sikh Maharaja's administration. The Maharaja ruled wisely and well. 
his heirs squabbled and fought. It's all here, the colorful characters set among mementos of court intrigue. The great ruler's son, Maharaja Sher Singh, was a heavyset man. He sat for his portrait wearing almost every jewel in the court, including the Kohenor diamond. Shortly afterwards, he was slain in a fight for succession. Jaleep Singh's mother and regent, Rani Jindan, is painted in profile. She has a handsome, well-sculpted well face and a look of disdainful resolve. Despite being locked up for long stretches of time, she never bowed to the bullying Brits and was a constant thorn in their side. Walking through the gallery, I was absorbed by the pictures, the jewels and the swords. Later though, I felt wistful. I thought of Justice Din Muhammad's contemptuous words when pressing the Muslim claim to Lahore. The Sikhs, he said, hadn't been around for that long. This bolted up collection of treasures suggests he was right. 40 years of Sikh rule was a blip. The kingdom shone bright for a while and then it was gone. The sands have closed over this time. The Sikhs left and their legacy gathers dust in the dark. Thank you very much. That is really an evocative passage and it has set off two or three trains of thought in my mind. So let me first pick the personal one, uh, which was you quoted Iqbal to say, Khudi ko kar buland itna ki har takdeer se pehle, khuda bande se ye khud poochhe ki kya teri raza kya hai? That what is it that you want? Uh, God asks you, you should be so strong. Uh, and your mother quoting that as a certain certain relevance, I would say, because, I mean, in, in here it was in 60 or something, she she walked out of this loveless marriage, uh, mm -hmm. which was, and, and from a family, which is which was one of the biggest families of, of Delhi, uh, it must have taken a lot of daring. Uh, and then not only that, she sort of went and remarried uh, after playing uh, tennis in uh, shockingly short skirts uh, at the Delhi Gym Khana Club and went and married a foreigner and went away and then went on to study Russian and uh, all sorts of things and work for Amnesty International. So obviously a very determined woman. Yes, yes. I mean, absolutely. And I think, you know, that part of, um, uh, in a sense, that that's the sort of second part of the book. You know, that there's sort of the... the the theme of, of discovery of, of freedom of India, um, you know, it's sort of right to self-determination, but, but the other sort of parallel theme is, is my mother's own, you know, search to um, assert her independence. And that, that's why really I, I read that particular passage. And I think, it, of course, it was extraordinary. I mean, it was the mid fifties when she left the, the marriage. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I mean, and as I, explore in the book that that the ramifications from that decision which was you know the right decision for her as an individual and a human being um the ramifications carried on throughout her life and you know most potently the rupture with her father as a result of that decision you know her father who you know was a progressive man in many ways you know his his adherence to his determination that his daughters should be educated in the same way as his sons, I think was also quite progressive. Um, but he never forgave her for putting her interest before family duty as, as he saw it. And family duty based also on a, you know, the, the fact that the family she'd been married into was the family that had helped um, our family so much after the partition and, and you know, given our family. Isn't that the reason why she didn't talk about India so much or go back to India as often? Yeah, I mean, I think there were two great taboos around, you know, her um, Indian heritage and life, I suppose. One was the partition and that was, I think, from, from her father, once they left and relocated in Delhi, it was his edict that they should never talk about what they'd lost. Uh, and I think that was admirable in many ways in that, you know, she says they, they got on with life. They didn't sort of hang her endlessly about something that was not retrievable. 
um, though it had its, you know, the extent to which suppressing trauma is good is obviously a, 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 a difficult. But, but the second taboo was about leaving uh, her marriage. And I think it was not, you know, us growing up in the West, the taboo wasn't really a moral. It wasn't because, you know, she felt ashamed. I think it was just a, because it was a desperate sadness that she still felt, a sadness that, you know, um, her relationship with her father was irrevocably damaged mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lost. And, and the sort of the larger questions you touched in the passage and, and you touch elsewhere in the book, uh, you know, you mentioned Jallianwala Bagh, you mentioned Kohinoor, you mm. mentioned the cruel in, in Lahore and where Lahore should have gone in partition. I mean, these are very, very complicated uh, questions. And um, uh, you, I, I think you, you do take a very sort of careful position and you sort of somewhere shy away from taking a position. Uh, for instance, on Jallianwala Bagh, I mean, you go from Kishwar's uh, Desai's point of view that this was a premeditated massacre uh, to Kim Wagner's uh, uh, you know, theory, which, which I personally have found fault with, is you know, this idea of colonial panic. And mm -hmm. uh, what the truth is that this was racialized colonial violence. And, uh, but, but I think, but these are complicated issues and I don't want to put you in a spot, but, but did you feel the need to sort of, uh, you know, you touch upon these issues, mm. uh, but, but you don't take, you know, you don't make choices. You don't, you sort of say, uh, you know, it, it's this and that. I mean, British mm. rule in India was good and bad. I mean, railways were good and bad. So was that a deliberate choice because you weren't really doing a history? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I think that what I found, I didn't have a preconceived sense of how I would do it because I didn't really know what I would find. Mm -hmm. But I think as I've suggested, I found um, that there is so much dispute and there are manifold different ways of looking at these events. Um, and as I touched on, you know, that just simply of, um, you know, in Pakistan, it's, they don't call it the partition because that implies a sort of secession. So, I mean, you know, right back to every single element of this whole historical experience, I think is, is contested. I mean, and that is what, what history is about. So I don't think I knew that until I start under, you know, until I began this exercise. But once it became clear to me that there were such different points of view and that you had scholars who devoted their entire lives, for example, to exploring one uh, and another, and historians who seemed to me, you know, I found historians who took this side, a historian who took that side, who on the face of it seemed to carry out, you know, um, admirable depth of research, but they ended up simply with a different perspective. So I think it came clear to me that what really was important for us to, to move on and move forward was to try a little bit harder, as I tried myself to do, try a little bit harder to understand different perspectives and other people's truths. And I think that I did deliberately think, I mean, I don't think I say, you know, there's good and bad about the empire. I mean, maybe I did descend a bit too much into um, that, but I was trying to be a little bit more sort of nuanced about it. And I was trying, I think, to give a sense of what the debate is, but think that, you know, that I think there's plenty of people out there advocating one, you know, interpretation and another. And I think I felt it was quite useful to be able to say, well, you know, we can have this discussion about a very contentious um, subject without necessarily, um, you know, feeling sort of anger and venom towards each other. Okay. I think that's what I, I think that's also my motive sitting here in London. Well, I, I think you should, uh, your book should encourage uh, more writing and research uh, from British uh, scholars on, mm. on issues. I mean, we see very little uh, coming out from, you know, we see a lot coming out from Indian scholars or from, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Mr. Wagner British, perhaps I, I'm not sure of his origins, but I don't, I, 
So you have British yeah. mainstream scholars like, uh, um, you know, about Chalyanwala Bagh, yeah. about, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the Kohinoor, about these issues. It all, it's all coming from this side. So, so uh, therefore, the debate sounds a little more strident than it need be. But do you know what I think is interesting, and maybe this is, um, you know, for, for later, but I think what's really interesting now here, and I'm personally turning my gaze to, to that, is how research of some of the, among some of the, I mean, even call it diaspora population, but, but people with origins in South Asia, um, who are themselves, but who have made, probably been born in Britain. I mean, I'm not sure with all of them, but I'm thinking of a historian, for example, Gurhapal Singh, who is attached to the London School of Economics and who, you know, you may well know, you know, who writes incredibly interestingly about, and he's uh, bringing a book out, I think, next year on Sikh nationalism or perhaps later this year. Um, Satnam Sangira, who's a Times writer, has written a very interesting book about empire who, you know, is a Punjabi, but who was born here. And I think that's a very interesting perspective. And I think that sort of touches on what I think is, is different and new and interesting about Britain, touches on what we, we started out talking about, which is how, you know, there's so many of us who, you know, who do have these different strands of our histories, different elements of our identities. And, you know, that, that maybe we can look at things in a slightly less binary way. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to try and pull in a couple of questions that have come in from, from the audience. I'll try to uh, sort of combine them. And essentially, it is uh, the, I the idea of uh, how do we remember, you know, should we remember? Mm -hmm. uh, in in I mean there are there are views like yeah, like your grandfather said that don't think about it don't talk about it don't look back and move on a lot of people did that mm -hmm. uh, at, at the same time I mean for instance I always compare this to the Holocaust and the Jewish identity and the Jewish idea of memory is that no remember every time you can because then you will prevent it happening again. So what do you say, and this is a you know, question, a mishmash of two or three questions mm -hmm. that have come. What, what is your idea of memory and how we should treat it? Well, that's such a complicated question. Let me see if I can, you know, try and put together something that's of value. I mean, of course, yes, I think we should remember. And the purpose of that, yes, is to try and learn. I mean, one of the purposes is to try and learn from our our mistakes on a you know a, a national level. But but how you do that is very difficult. And you know, I think this is important in terms of of memory for an individual and for a a, a country. And just dealing first with for an individual. I mean, my mother. We talked about suppressing memories of. Um, I mean. I think it is a natural human thing to suppress, to some extent, memories of something traumatic because it's, you know, it's a coping mechanism. You can't get through your, you know, it's to, and as with my grandfather did, to try and, you know, survive and move on and rebuild. I think in that period of rebuilding, to some extent, you know, there's a role for whether you want to call it suppress, I think parking you know, is, is maybe a, a good thing to do. You know, you can't always deal with something traumatic immediately after it's happened. I mean, in my mother's case, you know, it remained parked uh, and actually buried. Um, and I'm not sure that that is healthy. Uh, I think my writing the book with her, talking to her, in the end was a kind of, you know, helped her to, to, to come to terms a sort of reckoning. Moving, though, to the, which is maybe of, of Great, you know, the, the, the wider um, sort of picture of a nation, I think, yes, and I coming to Britain, yes, you know, we do need to remember, we need to, but that act of interpreting our history is a complicated one. And I think that we have to be very sensitive in doing that, you know, to, to, to be open to listening to, to all people, because people will have radically different views about what the past means and to find a way to allow that discussion to take place 
without it becoming acrimonious is difficult. And, um, you know, we can see that here now. We've got statues, you know, this whole debate over statues maybe is a, a way to look at it. You know, um, I personally see nothing wrong with looking at a statue and thinking, no, you know, this isn't the person we want to celebrate in the 21st century, you know, be it a, a slave trader or be it Clive of India, you know, we can have that discussion and decide no and move that statue. I'm not really against mobs of people coming and, you know, bashing down. That's not what democratic debate is about. But I think, you know, it, it, reassessment is always a, you know, is a good thing. It becomes and easier, easier with young uh, succeeding generations. It becomes easier. I think it does become easier. And, you know, I think a really interesting thing was this whole business about, and I think this applies to India, Pakistan, Britain as well, because, you know, we all have, we all create our national myths, you know, and, and slightly edit out the uncomfortable bits. Um, but I found a, a really interesting um, episode for me was attending the centenary of the end of the First World War, an event at the LSE, uh, in the hall where Gandhi had addressed, um, you know, students way back during the war, at the time when he was an advocate for what well, we thought empire was benign at that point, and an advocate for um, involvement in the conflict. But the point about that session was, it was called Cardi Poppy, was as part of the, I think, the determination now to recognise the contribution to both world wars uh, that was made by Commonwealth troops. And of course, you know, Punjabi, troops of Punjabi origin and Sikh origin played a huge role, as, you know, everyone in uh, the Punjab knows, but but many fewer people in Britain know. But that struck me as that is an example of a very constructive as well way of talking. You, you've got to talk about Jalin Wallabag, but you've also got to talk about those shared parts of history that you know, that the do draw us together. Absolutely. I think we probably have to wind up, but just I try to squeeze in just one more question. I mean, from your remarks and some of the things that you wrote in the book, um, I do see that despite the fact that you grew up outside and etc., you do you do have a certain understanding of the Sikh identity. Uh, and uh, is it instinctive and how much do you feel it? Is it because of your cousins or is it, does it come from inside? Well, yes. I'm very glad that you think um, I convey some understanding of it because I certainly, you know, tried and wanted to understand more. But I mean, I, I, I think that is an understanding that has purely been acquired. Maybe I had a little bit by osmosis because, as you know, we are very close to our uh, Indian family. But it's absolutely just the beginning. I mean, I do feel having written this book that's not at all the end for me. And I, I mentioned that, you know, now I'm opening my eyes much more to the diaspora here. Uh, and maybe this is a good way to end. Somebody has just sent me a book and I'm going to just show this. I mean, it's a book about a, a, a Sikh. Um, okay, he's called Suresh Singh. It's called Memoirs of a Cockney Sikh. And it's about a Sikh gentleman who's whose family, I mean, he's written it himself, whose family came to the east end of London, where I now live, um, in 1949. And, you know, he was, um, he was born here and he went back to, their, to, village, well, to visit their village, which was just north of Hoshiarpur, where my grandfather was given some lands after partition. But this is his experience growing up, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, at a time when, you know, race relations in this country were, were not great, to say the least. But his whole experience, it's a very positive story about, you know, how he became, I mean, he became a sort of figurehead of right. the East End of London. And I think just, you know, ending there, I, I think that, you know, that's part of the journey of discovering what is Sikh identity here in, in London. Well, um, I, I think, I don't know how much time you're going to go give to going back as QC, but I do certainly <laughs> hope and look forward to more writing uh, from your pen and more exploration of these very interesting and very complicated subjects. 
Marina Vila, thank you so much for being here with us at JLF and look forward to reading more from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Back to you, Kritik. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Marina and Mr. Sarna for that riveting conversation. Truly emotional. We thank British Council for supporting this session and we thank our celebration partners, Diageo. Thank you all for watching and please do pick up a copy of your book from the Amazon bookstore. Please do tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and tag us at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Detol. Hope to see you next time.